But the title of this morning's message is God's X-ray vision. We all know that God sees everything, right? And what's beautiful about it is that God just doesn't see. We, we don't serve a God uh, that is afar off. The Bible says that he's near. And we don't serve a God uh, that is not involved or uninvolved in our lives. But he's involved in every area, every aspect of our life. And so uh, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, God spoke through a man, uh, John, as they called him the revelator, because he gave revelations. And he shared with seven churches, and he had a distinct message for each one of them. And the church that I really want to focus on this morning is the church of Sardis, and that's found in Revelation chapter 3. How many of you have read about the church of Sardis? All right. So y'all are veterans in the history of Sardis. Many of you know that we're living in those times, the church of Sardis. If we look around, and Boston is a lot like how the D.C. area, call it the DMV, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, and on every corner, you see a liquor store and you see a church, folks. They are there Mm -hmm. through the inner city as well as in the suburbs, and yet the community (laughs) does not change. You know, I've gone on a few missions mission trips, especially in areas that were war torn. And in every area where armies have marched through, where there was, there was battles taking place, even though uh, it may be experiencing peace, uh, you can see in those areas uh, that uh, there was devastation that occurred. I mean, you, you, you can see that armies have been there. And so as I look around in all these places, these churches, some of them have these beautiful edifices, you know, and, and, and you can see them off of uh, the highways and, and the streets and all. And it, it just looks immaculate. And you see homes all around them. And you go around and you ask them, how are the, the, the marriages in this community? Oh, it's not so good, Pastor. How about the kids' communities? Oh, it's not so good, Pastor. What about the churches in this community? Oh, oh yeah, they're beautiful. Look at that. What about the schools? Oh, not so good, Pastor. What about morale? Oh, it's not so good, Pastor. But what about the church goers? Oh, they look good, Pastor. And you can't help but think, where is the army of God? I was in the prayer meeting this morning, and one of the gentlemen was sharing that we're part of the army of God that we're, we're part of a bigger group, even though you are called Calvary Chapel in the city, right? We have Calvary Chapel, Breath of Life, and we got Calvary Chapel spreading the light, and Calvary Chapel Good News, and they're all over the place, right? All these different Calvaries, all these different churches. And yet, folks, I can't help but ask, where is the, the evidence that a battle is going on. See, the reason why things aren't going uh, well that the churches and the church people look good is because they're not rolling up their sleeves. And, and, and they're not diving in into the communities and getting dirty. So much so that when you look around, you can tell that it's not just skirmishes going on. It's a full-blown war. We made peace, folks, where we should be what? Making war. 
And I want to talk about that this morning. That's what the church of Sardis was all about. It had grown apathetic toward its surroundings. And instead of wanting to get into the battle, they were looking for terms in which to make peace. A little bit about John, and I'm sure many of you know, uh, after they had placed him on this aisle of Patmos, they had a failed attempt to kill him. They had put him in a pot of boiling oil, and he wouldn't burn. <laughs> they had threatened him, and he wouldn't be silent. They had killed off many of his friends, but everywhere he went, revival kicked up. And even when they exiled them to this Isle of Patmos, where the enemies of the gospel thought he could be of no further use to the church, little did they know that there's no jail too guarded, no bars too thick, no island too far that God can't and won't still use a person for his glory. Did you know that? So here John, he's laying on his face while Jesus is dictating to his heart exactly what he feels is important for the church to know both individually and corporately what is needed and necessary in order to live a godly life. So if you haven't already, I'm going to encourage you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3 and look at uh, verse 1, if you would. It says... And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write these things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are what? Dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed, white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him what? Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I tell you, that's a mouthful, isn't it, folks? This is the fifth of seven letters to the church. Jesus could have uh, addressed many churches in many different cities, but he chose these seven churches in these seven cities. And why is that? Because each of the churches were either struggling with or being challenged by things we are going through right now in our culture, our community, and in our world. Ephesus had lost its first love, and therefore it became the backslidden church. Smyrna, it was called to endure uh, trials and tribulations, so it was called the persecuted church. Pergamus 
was encouraged to resist compromise. It was called the licentious church. Thyatira was called to reject and denounce false teachers and idolatry. And it was called the lax church. Sardis called to protect itself from apathy. And it was called the dead church. Then you have Philadelphia. It was one of the few that actually able to stand in the midst of all that opposition. And it was called the faithful church. And then finally, you had Laodicea. And we all know you heard many, many, I'm sure, messages on that. It was called the lukewarm church. Sardis the lax church, the dead church. Scripture says it was alive, but it was dead. How can that be? I, I tell you, I, I've lived this. I can really understand this uh, from a cultural perspective as, as well as from how I was raised and ultimately how God brought me into a saving knowledge of him. You see, in our culture and in where I grew up, everybody pretty much looked the same and thought the same. And one of the things that we didn't do is we did not make it seem that God was not important. No matter what, you still recognize God. The saying was, God is good. All the time, right? All the time, God is good. You, you heard that from the time that, that, that you were <laughs> in diapers to the time you went to school. Family members quoted that, even though they were living in complete opposition of it. We would go to church from time to time. And the times that we didn't go to church, we couldn't go outside to after one o'clock. Why is that, people? Because that's when church was over. And you better act like you went. <laughs> it didn't matter that you didn't. We was alive, and yet we were what? Dead. When I gave my life to Christ, I've shared this story many times. I can remember coming home, and I, I had never really seen anyone in my house read a Bible. I had six siblings, mom and dad. My dad had passed away when I was young. Uh, my mom would be considered a, a good moral person, and yet I never saw her read the Bible. And so when I got home, I started looking for a Bible because I had given my life to Christ. And we had this huge Bible on the coffee table, right? You open it up, some of y'all are familiar with it. And you had the names of family members in it. And so I, I sat on the couch and I put it down. It was as big as this, folks. <laughs> Seriously. And, and, and I'm trying to read it and I'm like, thee thou not really understand it. And my mom comes downstairs and she looks. She said, what are you doing? You know, in her eyes, you don't open that up unless somebody died. <laughs> and I said, mom, I got saved. I'm alive. She came over there and grabbed that Bible and said, boom. This is not for reading. This is for writing. Dead names. <laughs> See, we were alive, but we were dead. And so the Lord, in speaking to John, sharing with him about this church, see, he's, he's letting them know that apathy, and, and I'm convinced of this as well, is one of the most effective weapons in the demonic realm's arsenal against the church. 
because initially it doesn't directly present itself as potentially harmful, does it? Or, or dangerous or, or even destructive. It's not challenging us to fight or, or attacking us openly uh, where it becomes obvious to others that we're slacking off. You, you can be right here. You can be coming to church, right? And have an apathetic heart. You can be serving in ministry. And your mind is, you just can't wait for that guy to be quiet. You might be right now thinking about what sauce to put on that burrito. <laughs> when you get out of here. See, apathy does not necessarily show itself openly, does it? It is it, it is slowly but surely begins to erode that which should be catching on fire. He is telling us that we no longer need to press on. That we're okay spiritually. So now, let's just start the coast. See, that's what happened to this church. In the first three verses, this church is, we're told that they have a name that gives the impression that they're alive. But as we just talked about, they're dead. To be alive in name only. I mean, what a sad commentary, right, folks? But we see this today. I think about the denominations that carry the name of Martin Luther, the Lutheran church, or Charles and John Wesley, the Wesleyan church. If they were alive and saw what was going on today in their name, Luther, I doubt seriously that he'd be pleased. In fact, he's the one... That, 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 that nailed against the wall of the Catholic Church. Can you imagine what he would do in the church that has his name? <laughs> I believe he, teared, he wouldn't nail anything against it. He just tear the nails out of the boards and tear the place down. At yeah, this time, Sardis had seen his best days. It was on the decline. It was once a, a tower of power. It was built on a citadel on top of a mountain. The city was thought to be impregnable. Armies would march up to it, camp out for months. And once they couldn't get in, they just pack up and leave. That's how formidable this place was. They had trade routes running through the bottom of the mountains, so they had plenty of supplies. It, it wanted for nothing. And yet, it needed everything. As I was looking at this, I ran across a story of a soldier dropping his helmet down the city walls. And then he scaled down a hidden trail to retrieve it before going back into the city. He, he marked that trail, and he came back with a detachment of troops that night, and he found the city fast asleep and unguarded. Because of his position, the soldiers were so confident in his natural defenses, that they felt no need to keep a diligent watch. So no one thought to guard the city at night. And because of their complacency, because they thought they were secure, it led to apathy. And finally, the downfall of the entire city. I couldn't believe that. 
It was by accident. A guy who, you know, he drops his helmet. He's like, "Uh uh-oh, I can't be found without my helmet. I'm going to get in trouble uh, with my sergeant. And so he scales down to find his helmet, and he finds this crack in the wall, and he just marks it. And and he's like, you know, it looks like there's a little hole here. We're going to come back here at night. And they come back at night, and they find it unguarded. I tell you, folks, this is what we're facing today. The enemy is marching up to our walls and looking at us and, 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 and we're standing there and, 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 and we're looking apart and it looks like he's just walking away. But he's just coming around the side. And, and we're like, well, you know, he's not going to find anything there. But then he he sees those cracks in the walls of our walk, and he's sliding in. But he's not sliding in by himself. He's bringing things with him. And by the time we realize it, it's too late. We're collapsing. And now we're looking for what? Terms of peace. That's the church right there. You know, and I don't know if it's like this here in Boston, um, but uh, we had, during the pandemic, there were huge, huge meetings about whether or not we're to allow little kids to come to school and declare what gender they are. So a kid could just wake up, Five years old, little boy. Let's call him Johnny. He gets to school and he determines that he doesn't want to be Johnny today. He's going to be jail. And they actually had a meeting about this. Now, just that they would even discover, I mean, even talking about that. Now, I don't know about you, I, 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 again, I was raised in, in environments where not only if <laughs> I ask certain questions that it would be looked at like, uh, who are you talking to? But, you know, oftentimes I was just told what to do. And, and, and then, you know, well, why is this? Because I said it. Right. And, and, and we look at some of those things, we say, well, you know, no, 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 you, people need to understand, and sometimes they, 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 they need to, until they can do something, you got to explain everything. Does God do that with you and I? Does he explain everything to you? I don't know about you, he doesn't explain everything to me. <laughs> Grown adults were discussing this, that, that was amazing to me, uh, that, and I, I'm telling you, I fell asleep on it because I was like this they just going to say no this is nonsense they then had a second meeting a third meeting a fourth meeting and finally they decided that the kids knew better than the adults and they passed a law where children can determine their gender on any given day. Put it in writing, and now that's what's going on in the community. You talking about initially the church was up in arms, right? They were upset. They were marching out front. You know, they were mobilizing, and, and they were speaking the word of God. You know what's happened now? (laughs) They got in the buildings (laughs) signs for the kids to determine (laughs) what gender they are. If it's a boy, he wants to be a girl, got a bathroom for that. The girl wants to be a boy, got a bathroom for that. And then we got the traditional boys and girls. 
All we had to do, really? They didn't pass that law that they had to do it. They did it because they said, well, we want to be inviting to everyone. See, that's the compromise right there. That's the, that's the soldier dropping his helmet, yelling down, probing, finding, and then bringing back up. See, that's what happened to Sardis. And that's what's happening to the church, folks. In our desire to be completely inclusive, we have forgotten that God's word determines what is acceptable and what's not. See, this is what John was writing about. As he was writing about this this city, like the church, once known for its reputation of life and vitality, now it's dead. Again, it shows that Jesus knows what a church is and, and, and what a church does, folks. Nothing is hidden from him. In fact, when you go back to verse 2, it says... Be watchful and strengthen the things which what? Remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. He was letting them know that it wasn't too late. See, see, that's that's what we when we read about things like that and, and we think that something is dead. See, it in our world, when something is dead, that's it. It's it's final, right? But in God's economy, when something dies, it can also be what? Revived. And so he's telling John this to write this, not so that they can remain dead, but that they can what? Become alive again. See, that's that's where this encourages me. Uh, uh, folks, because as I, I will readily share with you, sometimes, you know, you, you will, I mean, entitled, my name is Pastor Keith, right? At, at home, you know, I'm dad. But in reality, sometimes, folks, I don't even feel like a Christian. Don't feel like it. Wake up like that. It not just something happened. I just woke up rotten like that, folks. My wife would tell you that. She's like, I'm praying for you. <laughs> but what's beautiful about this, folks, is that I don't have to listen to my feelings. Just because I feel like that doesn't mean it's what? True. So he doesn't give up on them. Nothing is hidden from him, but he doesn't give up on us even after he finds us what? Lacking. He instead, he instructs them as to what to do. And you know what the first thing he says? You see it right here, to be what? Watchful. I love that. This should have spoken volumes to this city because of his past, right? The city had failed because it wasn't washing. Uh, That story that I read to you had happened well over 100 years prior. And so everybody knew that story. The Lord always uses things we can relate to, folks. Second, he says, after being watchful, he says, strengthen the things which remain. Although things were bad, they weren't what? Hopeless. That, that's what I love, folks. I don't know about you. I, I, I tend to look at things practically, and sometimes I look at it and I was like, it's just not going to happen. You know, I'm ready to give up on it. And the Lord is like, give up on what? What do you mean? I tell you, I, I love a comeback story. How, how about you? I love comeback stories. You know, I'm a, 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 a sports buff, play sports since... 
I was a little kid. And I tell you that the gangs, when they bring on these things, they call them classics, right? The ones that I like the most is when somebody is down and out. You know, the, 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 the fans done gave up. They left at halftime. You know, the coaches, they pretty much, they taking off their headsets. They're like, you know what? It's over. But then all of a sudden, here's a first down here. Here's a, here's a touchdown there. Here's a field goal. And they're back in the game. And then here it is. And, and I'll be talking, and, and uh, my wife will come past and say, it is, she's learned, you know, because she used to think everything that I watched, the sports, that it was happening in real time. But she was like, had they already played that game? <laughs> and I was like, I'm reliving it. <laughs> Even then, I'm acting like it's just happening. We love a, a, a comeback. You know, God is all about that. Every last one of you here who know the Lord is your comeback story. And so he's telling this church, yeah, things are bad, but they're not hopeless. For although it's late, they were ready to die. It's not impossible. He says works were present. They just weren't acceptable. So what's needed is change. We were talking um, yesterday, and remember, uh, we were talking about the story of Philip. And the, the issue that we tend to run into is we think just because somebody has a problem or is problematic that that's the bad thing. That's not the bad thing. The bad thing is after God shows that there's a problem or something is problematic, is that you don't want to do anything about it. See, that's when it gets bad, folks. That's, that's when God calls it, really, unrepentance. Because he's showing you where the problem is. And yet we're not doing anything about it. It's actually good news that God shows us problems, right? In our lives and even in the lives of others. Because that means God wants to do something about it. And so that's what he's doing here. One of the biggest mistakes we make as believers is continue down a path that hasn't worked. We're, we're stubborn like mules. And many of you know this verse, but I'm going to quote it uh, anyway. This is one of the verses that I tried to make sure every one of my kids memorized. It's found in Psalms 32. Some of you are like, ah, yeah, nod in your head. Just because you know it don't mean you're applying it, folks. <laughs> I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. That's Psalm 32, verses 8. And nine. See, they needed to go back to when they were first saved. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I retrace my steps all the time, especially the older that I get. I'm so glad, you know, they got these things like key finders, you know, do, 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 do. You know, I'm so glad they're coming up with, with things that when you can't find it, you forgetful and all that. You know, they, they, they think they're smart that they, oh man, we invented this. God already had that. It's called the Holy Spirit. And when you hear it go off and it's showing you that no, you need to go back and let's retrace our steps. But many of us, we're stubborn like that, don't we? Aren't we? Some of us, you know, we get lost and still we don't want to take that right. We don't want to stop. We don't want to ask. We just going to keep doing it. Right. Around and around and around. So finally, we act like we just forced to do it. But I'm going to pull over over here. I got to get something to drink. Excuse me. Do you know, you know, I mean, we're just not going to do it. 
And we're like that spiritually. In verse 3, I love how the Lord, again, in speaking uh, to John, it just shows how in tune he is to the human nature. Where he shares with John in writing this and the way that John puts it, 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 it causes me to, again, to think how in the Gospels, uh, Jesus says he doesn't just, you know, he doesn't treat us like a servant, but he treats us like a friend. Where he says, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. You know, he, he could have pointed the finger. It doesn't, in verse 3, it doesn't, the way that it's worded, does it seem like the Lord is yelling at John? That he's saying, and I want you to point the finger at him. And I want you to show them, you know, the marks on your body that, you, that, that you've been boiled in hot oil as you're sharing this. You, you, what's beautiful, I've never, even in getting rebuked, I've never heard the Holy Spirit raising his voice at me, you know. Beautiful. He says, remember how you first received and heard. It was with passion and urgency that we all received the word of God. I, I shared with you how the guy gave me the analogy, putting your finger or putting your hand in the oven. But you know, when I prayed, I wasn't just walking around and saying, whoo, you know what? Uh, look at that oven. I was saved from that oven, you know, or, or from that stove. I wasn't thinking like that. I wasn't necessarily thinking after I got saved what I was saved from. I was thinking about what I was saved to. What you receive and what you heard. That's the motivation. That's what should cause us to say, I'm alive. And you know what? Now I want others who are dead to become alive. You got family members. You got friends. You, you, you have neighbors that don't know the Lord. They're alive, but they're dead. You who once were dead are alive. Are, are you like, Lord, give me, give me the shot. You know, give me the shot that I'll walk around whether they see it or not, and I'm just going to, whew. You know, they, they give this to uh, the people who, who OD, the, the, what is the knock it on, the, is, am I saying that right? Knock on, some of y'all know it. The knock on shot. That, that's what, as believers, we should be walking around with the salvation shot. Whew, you know, <laughs> you dead. Now, now, what are you doing? I'm trying to make you alive. We should be walking around with it, looking to give it out at all times. But apathy, folks, you know what? You might have it in your pocket, but you're not pulling it out, right? That's why Jesus tells John, says they receive the word of God with passion, with urgency at one point. And they held on to what they heard. Instead of applying it immediately. See, that had left. They needed to repent. They, they needed the urgency back. They, they needed to confess whatever the situation called for, according to the scripture, they needed to attempt to meet God exactly where he's telling them to go. Now, I don't know about you. I can remember this. I can remember the immediacy. Of it, I, I, where I needed to repent, I repented. Where I needed to confess, I confess. Whatever the situation called for, the Lord was sharing with me. I was like, I, I, I got to do it. Do you remember that? I remember the Lord even sharing with me. I needed to go apologize to a couple people in the neighborhood. 
that I had no business, you know, I, I had no business really talking to about that situation because I got away with it. And the Lord was like, you know what, you need to go back and you need to tell them. I'm like, what for? They, they seem to be fine about it. And it was an awkward and it was a tense situation, but I, I had to do it. It was so bad, folks, that I don't know if you have this because, you know, Steve says the pedestrians always had the right of way there. But in our area, there's a thing called jaywalking. I guess that doesn't exist here, you know, as long as the, you just walk out there. <laughs> you had to walk between the lines and you better not go out there. <laughs> <laughs> and I can remember walking, you know, I always run across the, the, you know, you cross the street when the cars wasn't coming. Didn't matter what the light was. That's how I grew up. <laughs> now the Lord is like, go back and walk between the cross. Go back and hit the button and wait. I can remember that, folks. I can remember the Lord telling me, yeah, yeah, you did. You did steal that Snickers three years ago. <laughs> or you didn't pay for it. Well, he knew it was in the bag. <laughs> and the Lord was like, go back and give him that 50 cent. I'm telling you, that's how sensitive things were. And all of a sudden, it was a numbness. Y'all can relate to that catch. Well, I don't need to say anything about that. Or God knows, or I repent later, or I prayed about it. See, that's what happened to this church. That's why the Lord was telling them to go back. See, the Lord, when he came to us, he didn't come to us as a taskmaster. He actually came to us as a friend. Before, we saw him as an enemy. See, how we respond to God's word determines oftentimes how God responds to us. If I belong to him, I hear these things and be obedient, then I, I, I can't help but see his grace and his mercy. If I don't, and I respond to him like the world, all I see is judgment and condemnation. A lot of that is, is, is the vantage point of where my heart is, isn't it? God hadn't changed. What had changed was me. And folks, we don't want the Lord. We don't want to look at the Lord the way the world does, do we? then what has to happen? We got to retrace our steps. When scripture describes Christ's return for the saints, it's from a perspective almost a relief, isn't it? Finally, you know, you're here, I've been waiting. It's not a shock from loss. I didn't expect you or, or, or want you coming. Like when, when you return home to find a thief has ransacked your home or violated it. You know, you're in shock. That's not how it's supposed to be when the Lord has come. We should be looking for him, right? You know, now in the church, they, they're like, man, if he's coming back, it'll be shocked. It's almost like he's unwanted. He's, it's, it's a violation. He's going, I don't, I'm not ready to go. And so in verse 4, he says, you, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and, and they shall walk with me in wow, for they are worthy, or in white, for they are worthy. Even amongst the dead Christians of Sardis, you know, there's a faithful remnant, isn't it? But notice only a few names. In Pergamos, it said the same thing. And Thyatira said the same thing. There were uh, uh, some bad, even amongst the good. But in Sardis, there's a few good amongst the bad. And this shows how stifling apathy can be. It grows. 
You know, if you become apathetic, you can't help but to pass that apathy on to others. And that's why it's so effective with the enemy. There was a time with many of you were excited to come to church, right? Excited to be involved in ministry. And then you get around some other people who are like, huh? Oh, yeah, but Pastor Steve is there. They're asking us to come 15 minutes early. And, you know, I was in ministry, but now you'll see. And before long, you're like, well, they are asking a little early. They, you know, did, you know, pray. Who has to, why do we got to pray so early? You know, an hour before service. Why can't we pray a minute before service? And that make the prayer a little shorter, right? And that apathy comes in. And you pass it along, and they pass it along, and it begins to grow. And, and now we have a church full of apathetic people who are no longer keeping the salvation shot close to them, but they're pulling it out at a moment's notice. It's just tucked in. Finally, in verse 5, where he says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Those who follow the Lord, those who are not defiling themselves, through idolatry or apathy or compromise, losing their first love, following false teaching, Jesus says they'll be known as overcomers. I, I like that. An overcomer. Someone talked about that. Victorious, right? You notice you don't become an overcomer. You are an overcomer as soon as you gave your life to Christ. Yeah, you, you're going through some things, and that's where, where we, you know, you ask some believers, and you're like, uh, uh, how you doing? Trying to make it. Just trying to keep my head above water. What are you talking about? Yeah, I just, you know, just, just keep swimming. You know, remember that cocktail? Just keep swimming, you know. No, drown. Go down. <laughs> That, that's what, you know, think about Peter. Peter was drowning. What did he do? He called to the Lord. See, that's the problem. For many of us, we, we need, we're overcomers. We, we're not called to overcome. You're overcomers. So whatever happens, you already got the victory. If all these things are happening, so what? Go numb. How many, how many past or... Well, I guess I could say past. How many past lifeguard people do we have here? How many of you have ever been a lifeguard? No one? Okay, that's good. <laughs> In lifeguard training, you know what they teach them? When somebody is drowning and, and you want to immediately say they're screaming, ah, well, you know, they're flocking around. Come on, immediately, I need to be saved. They don't teach them to go over there and, and try to save them. You know why? Because they'll grab on to them, and you'll both drown. You know what they tell? Let them go down once or twice. And when they go down once or twice, you know what they think? They're like, this is it. And they just reserve that this is it. And they say, that's when you can save them. Folks, that's us. See, we're overcomers. And, and yet, we're fighting all these different things, right? As if we got to overcome. Being an overcomer means no matter what happens to you, you already had the victory. So, so if it seems like it's all around you, folks, it's no big deal. You see that in, in the Old Testament with Elijah, his, his, his buddy came out. Told them that they all around us, you know, they surrounded us. And he, he was like, it's no big deal. No, you don't see it, Pastor. Look at all these people. And then he just said, prayed. He said, Lord, just show them. 
that is more with us than it is with them. And so are all the angels all around them. See, that's what it means to be an overcomer. No matter what the situation was, it was no big deal. 450 false prophets, no big deal. People after you, throwing you in a pot of boiling oil, no big deal. They want to crucify you. Hey, you know what? Do me a favor. Do it upside down. No big deal. But we made things a big deal, and it's led to our apathy. See, we need to walk in him. We need to remember him. And that's when, when we do that, that's when the, the, the pureness of salvation takes over. That's what white garments stand for purity, right? Purity is not you and I just being sinless, folks. Yes, you sin less, but it, it, it doesn't mean that. It, it really means that you're blameless. Meaning as the enemy is throwing all these things at you, it doesn't stick. When people look at you, they shouldn't just see somebody that's perfect. They should see someone's flawed, but someone who's redeemed. And when they see that, because they see that you're flawed, but redeemed, they're like, you know what? Why can't that be me? If the Lord did it for him or her, he certainly can do it. For me, if, if all you are presenting to them is sinlessness, then they're like, I can never get that standard. That's that's I can never reach that. Well, I understand why that person is saying they're perfect. You ever heard that? See, right here, as he's talking about white purity, the, it's a picture of close fellowship and friendship. It is Genesis 5, 24. You get a chance, you can look at it. Where it tells the story about Enoch. And it says, Enoch walked with God. And then he said, and he was not. Meaning he was what? Raptured up. He wasn't raptured up because he was perfect. He was raptured up because he was walking with him who's perfect. That's a big difference. It wasn't about him. It was about who he was with. God keeps books of everything that we do. Did y'all know that? The Bible says our tears put in a bottle. Our, our works, our praises, our lives. When, when we're born... Everyone is written in a book of life. Did you know that? Both saved and unsaved. But only those who surrender to Jesus, names will actually what? Remain. You know why? Because the Bible says they are those who what? Alive but dead. See, I don't know about you. But I'm not concerned about being alive according to this world. I want to die to the world in order that I may live. Before I was trying to be alive, when I was really dead, because I wanted to be like the world. I wanted everything that I had to offer. And all it was leading me Two was death. But now, I want to die to all of that. I desire that my purpose, my goals, are all wrapped up in pleasing the Lord. And I want everyone that I have a measure of influence in their life to feel, and then ultimately live the same way. That's my prayer for all of you. See, that's what happened in Sardis. 
I try to read this story at least once every six months because it's me. I'm prone to apathy, folks. I'm prone to forget I'm a leaky vessel. And I need to go back and retrace my steps. I always want to remember where I was and how I got saved. Because if I forget that, and I'm prone to forget why I needed salvation in the first place. Now, oftentimes, the Lord shows me that in order for that to happen, I need to be witnessing. The more that I witness, the more it reminds me <laughs> of who I was. The less I witness, the more deceived I become because I look at what the world's portraying. They look like they're having a grand time, don't they, folks? It's a lie. They're hurting just as bad as you were prior to salvation. And they need what you have after your salvation. They need the good news. I'm going to read this last verse. Many of you already know it. Hopefully, now that everyone has their 2.5 Bibles that you own in your different translations, you'll underline this verse in Luke chapter 10 and verse 20. Where Jesus had sent out the 70 and they came back and they were all excited for what they had did, you know, how they were casting out demons, and they were healing the sick, and, and, and they were just like, man, you should have saw me. Man, you should have saw how those people were looking at me. Boy, I'm going to go out here, and I'm going to me a new outfit so they can know I'm coming, you know? The power is here. You know, it's, it's interesting. Again, uh, uh, that they, they used to, I don't know if they do it here in Boston, but in my area, you know, when, when a prophet was coming, or a, or a miracle worker was coming, they put him out on posters, right? And you should see the look. You know, he'd be like this, you know. <laughs> like, he's give. Man, think about it. If the prophet, is, if you could cast out demons, you know, why are you telling them? So they can leave. It doesn't even make sense practically, but that, that's how my mind thinks, you know? You're supposed to be coming up on, they don't know you there, so you can cast them out, right? They're letting them know, advertising it, you know, telling them, here come the man of God, right, on a poster. But I love when you read this, how the Lord works in opposition of what man does. It says in verse 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because what? Your name. I've written in heaven. I tell you, anytime I don't feel like a Christian, which that happens, I don't particularly feel saved. I don't particularly feel good. And I remember this verse that says, my name is written in heaven. And God remembers it. I tell you, that picks me up right there. That lets me know that not only am I valued, but also that God still wants to use me. And those other thoughts, <laughs> you know what? They just slowly begin to disappear there. And then, not only I know who I am, but more importantly, I know whose I am. There you go. Y'all done heard that before. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's go before the Lord. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that you write the 66 love letters to us, Lord God. And you use all these different personalities, Lord, throughout the centuries, Lord God. that no one can accurately say that this was just written through the intellect of man. Man couldn't write the things 
that exist in this book. Because if we were writing it, we would be the hero of the story. Lord, you're the hero. You're the savior. You're the reason, Lord God, that we have hope. And so, Father God, I pray for any who are out there who don't know you, Lord. And through this worship service, Lord God, that you prick their hearts. That they see themselves pages of scripture. And that they desire, Lord, for their name. Be in the book of life. Lord, I pray for those who know you, Lord God, that if they're feeling discouraged, Lord God, or even apathetic, that they've been encouraged, Lord, and reminded that they belong to you. And you're not asking any of us to overcome because we're already overcomers. The victory has already been won. Now we need to walk in it. So whatever you need to remove from us or even add to us for that to happen, have your way with us. For well, Lord, we commit ourselves upon your altar. You need to prune us, Lord God. Lord, you need to disciple us, Lord God. Lord, you need to convict us, Lord God. Whatever it takes, Lord, for us to represent you in this lost and dying world, our prayers that you have your way. Thank you that you brought us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Lord, now let us be beacons of light. In a world of darkness. That when people are drawn. They come and they ask us. While we have hope. That we'll simply point to you. And you will draw them unto yourself. Lord it's in the name of your son. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And again. We give you the praise and the glory, as we all say, amen. amen. amen.